our last stop in our tour of the properties of cyclic groups is to close the loop on characterizing the nature of all subgroups of a cyclic group. So cyclic groups, remember, are really nice because we can always keep one of two models in our mental image of what cyclic groups look like. Infinite cyclic groups all look just like the integers under addition. It looks just like the number line with the role of the exponents on our generator playing the role of the integers. Likewise, every finite cyclic group can be envisioned as one of these clock groups, one of these addition mod n groups on the integers, where again, the role of those equivalence classes mod n is played by, again, the exponents on the generator for our cyclic group. So that's great. We also know a lot at this point about what kinds of subgroups cyclic groups must have, namely, for a finite cyclic group, every divisor of the order of the group will have at least one subgroup that has that as its order. So if I start, for example, with a, a cyclic group of order 40, then I know it's going to have a subgroup of order 1, order 2, order 4, order 5, order 8, order 10, order 20, and order 40. Uh, did I miss any? I don't think so. Uh, so every divisor of the order of the group has at least one subgroup of that order. And that's really powerful. What it's going to allow us to do now is to come up with a picture that we call a subgroup lattice that we can use to visualize all of the subgroups of a cyclic group and also show how those subgroups relate one to another. So how does a subgroup lattice work? What we're going to do is take all the subgroups of our cyclic group and arrange them in a nice fashion in increasing uh, order of their orders. Sounds weird. Just the, the subgroup with the fewest elements we'll put on the bottom, the subgroup with the most elements we'll put up at the top, and then everything else in between in a nice ordering. And then also, we're going to draw lines in this lattice that connect subgroups to their parent subgroups. So what's contained in what? Uh, these really we can think of as subset relationships, but they turn out also to be subgroup relationships, because a subgroup of a subgroup of G will also itself be a subgroup of G. So let's see what the picture looks like for a cyclic group in its subgroup lattice. So let's again take our ordinary clock group, Z mod 12, the operation of addition mod 12. I'm going to write down its elements, the residue classes mod 12. I'm going to not use the brackets around them because I don't want to carry the brackets around. But we'll understand these elements to mean the equivalence class mod 12 of 5 and of 10 and so forth. So what's a subgroup lattice for this going to look like? So we need to somehow be able to list all of the subgroups of my group G. And we know, without knowing anything else about what this group is, or how it behaves, or what its properties are, we know that it will be a subgroup of itself. So the largest subgroup of Z12 is going to be Z12. So that's going to be our subgroup of order 12 up here at the top of my lattice. And also, every group is going to have a smallest possible subgroup, namely the trivial subgroup, the subgroup consisting only of the identity element. So we can just go ahead and throw those two things in our subgroup lattice right away, with the biggest one at the top, Z12, the whole group, and the smallest one, the identity uh, element only, the trivial subgroup, down at the bottom. Now we can pull in the theorem from the previous slide that says that every single divisor of the order of my group will have at least one subgroup with that many elements in it. So what I'll do is add some rungs to my ladder here. And I'm going to add one rung for each divisor of 12. For example, 2. Can I find a group of order 2? I absolutely can. We did a couple of videos ago. Right? The group whose elements are 0 and 6 inside of Z mod 12, that's a subgroup of Z mod 12. Closure, associativity, identity, inverse, all good. Under the operation of Z mod 12, addition mod 12. And there's two elements in this subgroup. So we'll put that on the next rung up. And we'll draw in, in this little line, which is like a subset line. Right? This subgroup is a subgroup of that subgroup. And it turns out that that's the only subgroup of order 2. Uh, we can know that looking at our previous video and noticing that there's only one element of order 2 inside of Z mod 12, namely 6. And so the subgroup that it generates is going to be the only subgroup of order 2 inside of the cyclic group Z mod 12. Now we have to be very careful to remember that we're looking at a cyclic group here. And so that's what allows this process to, to stop. That's what allows us to stop looking for other order 2 subgroups once I found the one which is generated by the single element of order 2. If this were not a cyclic group, we wouldn't be as certain 
that there might not be other subgroups of order 2 that are not those that are just generated by an element of order 2. But because of the cyclic property, all of them are. The next rung up, the next largest divisor of 12, would be 3. So what subgroups exist of order 3? Well, find me my elements of order 3, and I will find you a subgroup that contains those elements. So 4 is an element of order 3, and the subgroup that it generates has the elements 0, 4, and 8. That's a subgroup of Z mod 12 under the operation of addition mod 12. It's not a super set of 0, 6, so I'm not going to draw a line between these two, but I will draw a line from here to there because the trivial subgroup is a subgroup of this one that we just found. And it turns out that there are no other subgroups of order 3 also because they would have to be cyclic, and in order for them to be cyclic, they would have to be generated by an element of order 3 because our group G is a cyclic group. But the only elements of order 3 in Z mod 12 are 4 and 8, and they're already accounted for. Each of them is a generator for this subgroup of order 3. How about order 4? Well, if I pick an element of order 4, like 3, for example, in Z mod 12, then the subgroup that it generates will be a subgroup of order 4 inside of Z mod 12. Are there other elements of order 4? We decided the answer was yes, but the only other element of order 4 was 9. And 9 also generates this same subgroup. So that's the only subgroup of order 4. And the line that I'll draw in connects 0, 06 to 0, 0369, because this subgroup is a subset of this subgroup, and therefore also a subgroup of that subgroup. Again, under the operation of addition mod 12. One more step up the ladder. Order 6, there's only one subgroup of order 6. Even though there are two elements of order 6, namely 2 and 10, both of them generate the same order 6 cyclic subgroup that consists of 0, 2, 4, 8, and 6, 8, and 10, the, the even residues mod 12. And here, I'm going to draw two subset containment arrows, one of them down to 0, 6, because it's a subset, but then also another one down to 0, 4, 8, because it's a subset. So what you'll notice is this really is a lattice, it's not a tree. We can kind of have paths that come back and reconverge in on themselves and so forth. And then finally, since there's no divisors of 12 between 12 and 6, I don't have any other subgroups that I can list. So I'll finish just by drawing two more containment arrows up to Z mod 12. And this here is a complete rendition of the subgroup lattice of the cyclic group Z mod 12. So the theorems that we have about cyclic groups are enough for us to do this subgroup lattice process with absolutely any cyclic group, because every divisor of the order of the group is going to have a subgroup associated with it, and that subgroup will be cyclic. Since we know how to count the number of different elements of a given order that they are, each one of them is going to generate its own subgroup of that many elements, and so we can use the principles that we've learned in these videos to come up with a complete list of all the subgroups that a cyclic group has. In a very real sense, this collection of videos was both the beginning of a story about cyclic groups, but also kind of an end of a story about cyclic groups, at least as far as the finite cyclic groups are concerned. We can't really say much more other than this that's interesting, uh, because once we understand the subgroup lattice of a group, we understand a ton about how that group is put together, how it's built out of smaller pieces. Um, if we were to try to do the subgroup lattice process for a non-cyclic group, it would be a lot more interesting of a process. Um, because in any given order that we could possibly have, first of all, we don't know yet whether or not the orders of subgroups will be restricted to divisors of orders of the supergroup, the parent group. Um, it does turn out that that's the case, but we're not ready to prove that yet. And even on one rung of this ladder, um, if this were not a cyclic group, we may have a lot more possibilities for subgroups of that given order. And I just want to close this video by giving you a taste of that for a case where the group is not a cyclic group. Let's take the dihedral group of the hexagon, the group of symmetries of a regular hexagon. That's a group of order 12. We've been writing the elements using this notation, so R for a rotation by 60 degrees, it would be in this case, T for a reflection about a central axis. Um, those are the two generators of this group. Um, this is not a cyclic group, and one of the best reasons why it's not a cyclic group is that it's not an abelian group. We know every cyclic group is abelian, that was one of our fun facts about every cyclic group a couple of videos ago. But then the contrapositive of that says any group that's not abelian can therefore not be cyclic. 
And we know D6 is not an abelian group, therefore D6 cannot have been a cyclic group. So what happens when we explore the subgroup lattice? I chose this example because the order of this group is the same as the order of Z mod 12. And so we'll have the same divisors that we can use as our first candidates for how to look for, for subgroups of a given order. And we know that the top and the bottom of this lattice are going to be the same. There's always only one group of maximal order and one subgroup of minimal order, the whole group and the trivial subgroup. But then, let's say we take our first step and look for subgroups of order 2. Well, if there are any elements of order 2 inside of my group, then I know that they are going to generate cyclic subgroups of order 2. And there are a bunch of elements of order 2 inside of this dihedral group. There's r cubed. This is a rotation by 180 degrees. That's an element of order 2, because if I rotate by 180 degrees twice, I get back to where I started. Therefore, this subset, consisting of the identity and the third power of my rotation, that is a subgroup, and it's a subgroup of order 2. But there's also a ton of other elements of order 2 inside of my dihedral group, and indeed in any dihedral group. All of these elements, t, tr, tr squared, tr cubed, tr fourth, tr to the fifth, all of those are rotation, uh, not rotations, they're reflections of my regular n-gon, hexagon in this case. And because they're reflections, they too are of order two. They're involutions. When I compose them twice, I get the identity back. A reflection composed with the same reflection again gives me my original figure back. So all of these, because they're elements of order 2, will generate cyclic subgroups of order 2 as well. So they look like E and T together, E and TR, E and TR squared, E and TR cubed, E and TR fourth, E and TR to the fifth. All of those are subgroups of order 2. So already you can see that the picture is very different than the picture that we had for cyclic groups, because now we have a ton of order 2 subgroups. If you count them up, there's uh, seven of them. Uh, we can show that those are the only seven, but we won't show that right here. And as you start to work your way up the lattice, uh, you find some subgroups of order 3, you find some subgroups of orders 4 and 6, and so forth, but the picture is much more complicated. So it's actually a really interesting question to try to figure out the subgroup lattice for a non-cyclic group in general. It's not one that we're going to tackle now, but the cyclic case is interesting enough for us to be satisfied.